About one month ago, I posted a video about this little 4-bay NAS case, and well, after that video, you guys did not hesitate to provide feedback. With over 50,000 views and hundreds of comments within the first week alone, I realized there were so many things that could have been made better. And some of the feedback I received sounded a bit like this. We need more drives. Where is the PCIe slot? It's too much work to swap drives. Can ich bitte mehr Platz für die SSD haben? Originally, I was planning to just do some adjustments to the previous design, but those adjustments quickly changed into a full redesign from scratch, starting with what essentials I needed the case to fit. First, I started with just the drives, then added some SSDs, a motherboard, a CPU cooler, a single slot PCIe card, and of course, a power supply. With the layout set, it was just a matter of designing an inner chassis to mount all the parts to, and then a box to put all of that into. And before I knew it, I had given birth to a brand new case design. This case is improved in almost every way possible, and you're about to see why. First of all, the footprint is almost identical to the previous version, only adding a little bit to the height, while still being printable within the same small print volume of only 210 by 210 millimeters. So you will have no problem printing this on some of the most common printers out there. Second of all, which is the best part, this case has a magnetic removable front panel, which gives you full access to all the interior parts of the case, including the six hot swappable front accessible hard drive base, in addition to three hot swappable 2.5 inch SSD mounts, allowing you to swap drives in no time. The case was also designed with cable management in mind, with dedicated zip tie mounts and holes to feed some of the cables through, allowing you to keep things nice and tidy. The design was made using Shaper 3D, and the new design is made to be both stiffer and also easier to assemble than the previous version. By checking out the printables link in the video description, you can also find detailed printing instructions and parts lists to help you get started with this project. The exact filament usage will vary a little bit depending on your specific settings, but with the recommended settings you can expect to use a little bit under 2kg of filament in total. To start, we want to build the internal chassis, which is what will hold our drive bay and most of our other parts. The internal chassis consists of three main panels, which are held in place with three side panels. To join them, we're using some M3 threaded inserts and screws. The three middle panels require seven threaded inserts each. The first panel we want to grab is this part here, which has the markings R and L on it. We also have two side panels marked with those two same letters which makes it easy to know which panel goes on which side. We want to attach these side panels to these two holes second from the top, and we can repeat this for the opposite side as well, with two screws on each side. Then we can move on to installing the bottom panel, which simply drops in between the two side panels and pay attention to make sure the threaded insert holes are facing the same way as the panel above. The side panels then attach to the bottom part in the exact same way as the panel above, with two screws on each side. Next, let's add some cooling to the drive bay. To do that, we can grab this fan panel and make sure to align the holes with the threaded inserts. We can then add two slim 92mm fans and we want to mount them with the cable pointing out the top of the fan, not the other way around. These fans are used to actively cool the hard drives by forcing air through the chassis to make sure your drives operate in a comfortable environment. The fan panel attaches using three screws on the top and three screws at the bottom of the panel. When that's in place, we can move on to installing the motherboard panel. Make sure to feed the fan cable through the dedicated cutout in the motherboard panel to keep things nice and tidy. This panel also uses two screws on each side to attach to the two side panels. And just like that, our internal chassis is all assembled. That wasn't too hard, was it? Now, let's try adding some hard drives. We want to have the hard drives mounted like this. And to do that, we need to attach these sliding brackets to the hard drive. Each bracket has a triangle cutout to indicate which side of the bracket should be on the SATA connector side. The bracket mounts to the drive using up to three regular 632 screws on each side. We can then flip the drive over and attach the other bracket making sure to also align the triangle with the connector side. And our drive is now ready. Each drive has a little hook on the bottom bracket to make it easier to pull out of the chassis. The top bracket also has a little flexible part in the back. This will push like a spring against the rear panel of the drive bay, making sure the drive fits snugly. The drive bay has a latching mechanism that has some flex to it. To install the drive, we must align the hard drive brackets with the tracks on the chassis, before pushing the drive all the way in until it latches into place. Here, you also get a good look at how the spring mechanism is pushing the drive back to lock it into place. Then, it's just a matter of repeating this process until all the drives are installed. 
The drive bay is now complete and as you can see, even with mostly 1 inch thick drives, there's still enough room for the fans to effectively push away all the hot air that builds up in between the drives. Do you like what you see so far? If you do, I'm sure you'll also like some of the stuff I'm going to post the next time or the time after that. So make sure to consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss out on my upcoming projects. Anyways, at this point in the build we can add our motherboard standoffs. These simply tap themselves into the plastic holes in the panel. I've made sure to add 3D models for both M3 and 632 thread sizes. We can now drop into place our ITX motherboard and secure it in place with the correct screws matching the threads of our standoffs. In addition to the 6 3.5 inch drives, this case can also hold up to 3 additional 2.5 inch SATA SSDs. These have their own custom brackets that screw directly onto the 4 screw holes on the back of each SSD. What's cool about these brackets is that they have this little flexible latching mechanism. The bracket with the drive attached will simply slide directly into the underside of the motherboard plate and the little flexible arm will latch it securely into place. To remove the drive again, all we have to do is to pinch our fingers together and pull the drive back out. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this case was designed with easy cable management in mind. So therefore we have a dedicated cutout in the side of the drive bay to feed the SATA cables through. What I like to do is to add just one cable at a time and feed it through the hole in the chassis until they're all in place. One idea if you're using flat cables like mine is to stack them in the order that they're attached to the drives. This way you can easily know which cable is which, then zip tie them together in that order. Another solution is to mark each individual cable on each end with a matching number or letter to tell them apart. After the SATA cables are in place, we can click into place the second 2.5 inch SSD. At this point we can set the internal chassis aside for a bit, because we are ready to start assembling the external cover of the case. The external cover consists of a bunch of flat panels that will be joined together using a combination of 3D printed joints and screws and we want to start by grabbing the external bottom panel, which can be identified by these two long tracks. Now the side panels, top and bottom, all attach using 3D printed joints and tracks. Each track is embedded into the part and each track also has a locking pin to ensure the parts cannot move in the direction of the joint. The corner panels all have a 45 degree angle joint on the end and to find out which part should join with which part we can simply align the parts like this and test to see if the tracks align when the locking pins align. We want to make sure the joining tracks match on both parts and that the locking pin fits into the other part as well. This way we know that the part is in the correct spot as all these panels have specifically been designed to only fit one way if it's matched with the correct part. When you are ready to join two panels, we can grab one of these 3D printed joining pieces and often it's easier to add these while the parts are standing vertically. And remember that these are not intended to be removable once installed, so don't worry if the tolerances feel a little tight. But again, you should be able to push them most of the way down with just your hand. The other half is also assembled in the exact same way by aligning the matching corners and pushing into place the corner joining pieces. When the two halves are assembled, we can pull them together and join them in the middle using this special joint that locks both parts to each other. If the tolerances feel very tight like mine, I recommend using a screwdriver or something light to gently tap the pins all the way down until they are flush with the inner edge of the frame. This part of the case requires an additional 8 M3 threaded inserts. The threaded inserts are used to secure this two-part rear panel, which will actually lock the entire assembly together, also trapping all the locking pins into place with a total of 8 M3 by 10 mm screws. The assembly now feels very sturdy. Our SFX power supply can now be installed, and it's mounted directly to the external cover of the case, and to relieve unnecessary stress on the rear panel, the design includes this little shelf that the power supply can rest on to make sure the rear panel won't bulge out due to the heavy weight. The power supply secures in place with four screws from the rear side of the case. Now let's quickly jump back to our internal chassis because this entire thing is going to slide into the external panel and before we do that we want to install all the connectors that may be difficult to reach once the assembly is inside the cover, like for example our SATA cables and CPU power cable or fan cables. We must also not forget to add a 12mm power button to the upper rear corner of the external cover, and I recommend having a relatively long power button cable or an extension cable to make sure it reaches all the way down to the power button connector, which is usually located in the front of the motherboard. 
Another cool feature about this case is how the internal chassis will actually stiffen up the whole assembly by pulling and locking into place the side panels with a 45 degree French cleat hook on each side. It's also a good idea to remember to add the IO shield if it's not permanently attached to your motherboard. One trick to keep it in place is to use a USB device to hold it in the correct position while you slide it into the case. The internal chassis is mounted to the external cover with three screws in the middle under the IO shield. Also, don't forget to secure your single slot card into place if you're using one. I recommend using a relatively long cable for your power button, as it has to reach all the way to the front of the motherboard. I also recommend to mark your power button cable with a little reminder to unplug it before you slide the chassis out again to avoid accidentally ripping it apart. Then it's just a matter of finishing up the cable management and cleaning it up a little bit with some zip ties. And at this point we should be able to power up the system and see if it works. Unless you're planning to use the third SSD slot for your operating system. Because so far, if you haven't noticed, I've only installed two SSDs. The third 2.5 inch SSD actually slides with a similar mount into the top panel of the external cover and locks into place just like the other two. When that's in place, we are ready to move on to the final stages of the build, which is the front cover. The front cover is secured into place using a total of 8 magnets, 4 of them on the chassis and 4 of them on the cover itself. The magnets are simply pushed into place and may or may not require some glue to stay in place depending on your tolerances. The logo insert also just pushes into place and may or may not require glue and this also goes for the little colored piece in the middle of the logo. Now to make sure we get the magnet polarity right we can place one magnet at a time onto the front panel magnets we already installed. This way the magnet will automatically align itself to the correct polarity and this way we know that the top of the magnet should be facing into the opposite hole. I recommend marking it with a little black dot with a sharpie just to make sure you put the right side into the opposite hole. Then we repeat this process for all four magnets. At the bottom of the lower part of the front panel there's a little 45 degree edge that can be aligned with the bottom of the case and tilted into place until it attaches to the opposing magnets. The top half of the front panel will actually share the same two magnets in the middle as the lower panel with a similar 45 degree mount going into the lower part, while the panel has its own magnets to hold it in place at the top. Both halves of the front panel are also countersunk a few millimeters into the main chassis to prevent any up, down or sideways movement. And just like that the case is complete. Even though this was only supposed to be a simple adjustment of the previous model, I'm glad I took it to the next step and did a complete redesign instead. When it comes to noise levels, this case does not use the same vibration damping mount like my previous version, so there is some audible vibrations, but simply by adding some sticky soft feet to the bottom of the case, I was able to reduce it so much to the point where you don't really think about it anymore. When running Cinebench on my Ryzen 7 5700G with the Noctua NH-L12S, the maximum temperature reached was just over 76 degrees, which I think is reasonable given the compactness of the case. If you are interested in building this case, the files are available to download for my Printables members. And you can become a member by checking out the Printables link in the video description. The membership fee is as low as a cup of coffee a month and it also includes access to my Discord server for direct access to me and other members for project help as well as project updates and the ability to influence my decisions when making new projects. I have also now added the option to individually purchase a project for a one-time fee after several people requested this as an option instead of becoming a member. Thank you for all your support and all your feedback. Both negative and positive feedback is taken with great appreciation, as it helps me grow and learn to get better. I have tons of cool projects lined up for the next few months, for example the full-size ATX case. So if you're interested in following my constantly evolving journey towards better projects, make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss it. Thank you so much for watching and I really hope to see you again in my next video.